I want to be a UFC fighter, but I can't afford tuition at an MMA school. How do I approach an MMA school about training me for free and then I give them a cut of my winnings once I make the UFC? That is this week's question of the week. I am Saad Al-Aziz, the owner and head instructor of Simple Fortis Jiu-Jitsu, here to tackle this week's question of the week. This popped up, um, it was a question on one of my videos that I posted. Um, a person wrote out this question, and it's not somebody I met because this isn't an MMA school here. I don't teach at an MMA school anymore. I just run a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo school here in San Antonio. But I'm going to tackle this question. Um, I used to teach at a lot of MMA schools. Um, I got out of that. Um, I haven't done that in over 10 years. Um, and I want to answer the question because I know a lot of young folks look at going into MMA and they would like to be you know, the next UFC champion. And what I want to say is that the reality of it is, is that you have a better chance of winning the Nobel Peace Prize than you do of ever becoming the UFC world champion. And a lot of people aren't going to tell you that. They're going to send you right up there in the cage. And there's a lot of promoters. You don't even have to have any expertise. You can just go in there, be a tough street fighter. They'll put you in the cage. And, you know, it won't go well for you, not long term. You've got to have some skills. And so when you go into an MMA school that's got trainers, you know, there's going to be a striking coach, there's going to be a grappling coach. Maybe another coach that's going to put everything together for you in the cage. Maybe a conditioning coach. Maybe a nutritionist. There's a lot going on at these MMA schools. In addition to all the equipment and the salaries that they have to pay. And the rent, you know, for the building and the electricity. That they're not, they just can't take on free students. They have bills to pay. And it's not that we're doubting the fact that you could possibly become world champion one day in MMA. It's possible. But as I said, it's highly unlikely. Just the chances. You know, and you know, Muhammad Ali used to talk about um he said, you know, I didn't he didn't worry about fighting the fighters that lived in the penthouse, living the good life. He worried about fighting the fighter that was living out of his car. Because that guy was gonna bring it. And you've got MMA fighters coming from around the world. And their ticket to a better life is they got to win those fights. And they're going to bring a lot of skill. And they're going to bring a lot of courage and determination to these fights. And so an MMA school is just not going to be able to take you on under the promise that, yeah, you're going to make it. And then you're going to give them, you know, payback, you know, with um, your winnings. Because chances are, you know, most people that walk in the door are not going on to be the UFC champion. And most people aren't even going to make the UFC. If you make the UFC, that's like making the NBA or the NFL. It's, it's a long shot. You, you are going to put years of work, sweat, blood, and tears into that effort to make it to that level. And, you know, a lot of elite level people, you know, they'll be world champions in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo or, you know, elite level strikers and Muay Thai, Taekwondo, or Karate, and they never go on to become the UFC champion. That is an incredibly difficult goal to achieve that very few will ever achieve. And, you know, even if you make the UFC, um, if you're fighting on the prelims, at least, you know, seven, eight years ago, the prelims, you know, those fighters were still making less than 10 grand you know, for that fight on, in the UFC on the prelims. You know, I'm sure with inflation it's gone up a little bit, but I doubt you're going to make very much money on a prelim fight. Like, you have to be getting up to top contender, you know, championship level before you're really going to be able to make some payback, and that's, that's a long shot. So most MMA schools are not going to be able to, you know, offer you that kind of deal where it's like, oh, we'll just train you from beginning all the way to UFC champion, and don't worry about paying us until, you know, you make it big. Whew. That's probably not going to happen. In most cases, it's not going to happen. You know? um, and there's a number of factors that go into that. One, a lot of people who haven't been trained are under the illusion that they had success as a street fighter, and that will translate over into MMA. 
And that is so far from the truth. Because in street fighting, you know, whether it was in middle school, high school, you know, maybe you was bigger and stronger, maybe you had a little bit more skills or a little bit more athletic than your opponent, or maybe, you know, they made a mistake, you hit them with a flute punch, you won the fight. Or so many street fights happen in bars and clubs where people are intoxicated. You know, that's, that plays into the outcome of that street fight. And so sometimes a person could be a successful bar fighter thinking, oh man, this will translate to the UFC. But it's not because your opponent in MMA, he's not coming in there drunk or intoxicated. You know, they're coming in like fully alert, ready to go. And they're coming in with a serious skill set. Like I was talking to Matt Hughes, former UFC champion, about four or five months ago. And um, he was talking about his high school wrestling career because he was a wrestler in high school and college. Very successful. His goal in high school was to win 100 matches, which was like the gold standard in Illinois high school wrestling. If you could win 100 matches, like you just, you were setting, you know, that you were setting the world on fire. That was, that was an incredibly rare accomplishment. And Matt not only won over 100 matches in high school wrestling, he won them consecutively. He just did not lose. He just kept winning. State title after state title, he just, he just dominated high school wrestling. And then he went on to college wrestling, and then ultimately went on to the UFC, and then ultimately became the UFC champion. So if you have to face a wrestler like Matt Hughes, who's phenomenally good, not just skilled in wrestling, but phenomenally good at wrestling, and your experience base is backyard wrestling with your brothers and your cousins and the neighborhood kids, it's not going to be a good outcome for you. Just like... Um, you know, you get people who are, you know, have successful fist fights. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm pretty good. And then um, you go against a well-trained boxer or kickboxer or Muay Thai fighter. And you think, oh, I got good hands. I'll do well. No, you won't. You're gonna, it's going to go really bad for you. So you're going to have to develop these skills. And street fighting does not translate over into MMA. You know, MMA can translate over to street fighting, but it's not the other way around. So... You're, you're going to have to dedicate years of blood, sweat, and tears to training to get ready for a successful MMA career. And you know, you're going to have to figure out how you can pay the tuition at that MMA school. Because they're not being greedy at the MMA school. Just realize that you know, like, they have to pay their staff. You know, they have to pay for the facilities, the electricity, all the equipment. You know, it's, not, it's not a free endeavor for them either. You know, like, and you know, they're trying to make a living. So, you know, they're just not going to take on that deal. Plus, you know, I've, I've, I've trained with a lot of MMA fighters that went on into the UFC. And I would say, man, almost all of them. With, I can only think of maybe one or two who switched teams somewhere along the line between when they started to when they got to the UFC or after they got to the UFC they switched their MMA teams. And a lot of times what happens is they're with one MMA team and that team gets them trained and they go through the amateur circuit and then they go through you know, the smaller professional circuits, then they get to the UFC and then they take a loss. Next thing you know, that fighter's like, you know what, I need, I need to be on a bigger and better team. Um, you know, this, this small team that got me here, I can't stay with them, I'm just switching over. Next thing you know, they're on Greg Jackson's team or TriStar or American Top Team and they're switching over and they're in a new camp because, you know, like, loyalty is a funny thing. You know, everybody's loyal until it's not in their best interest no more. And it's like, ah, maybe, you know, I need to switch to a new team. And it happens. So that's another reason, like, you're, you're not going to find an MMA school to agree to that deal because... They know that even if you do make it to the UFC, there's a good chance you might switch teams. So they'll never get paid back for their efforts. And you can't even give them advertisement once you get to the UFC because, what is it, Reebok? Yeah, all the fighters gotta wear Reebok. You know, they have to wear the UFC advertisement. They don't get to wear like, you know, their school advertisement. So you don't even know what school they came from. Just, they're in the UFC. So there's very little in it for the school to just 
start training people for free. Like, it's not that they're not good people. You know, they'd like to, but you know, like they have to make a living. They have to pay their bills. So yeah, they're not going to do it. And realize, you know, like the people you're going against in the UFC. You know, the skill level that you're dealing with. You know, like I talked about Matt Hughes. But you had like Damian Maya and Jacare, who fought in the UFC, and they were both Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, multiple-time world champions. They were like elite level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belts. And neither one of them ever won the UFC title. You know, they fought in the UFC, but they didn't win the title. Um, you had guys like Rashad Evans, who, you know, twice won um, the NCAA championship in wrestling in his weight class at Michigan State. And you're going to be grappling against somebody like that. And then you got world champion Muay Thai fighters entering, you know, elite level boxers. And, you know, you're going to be standing up trading punches and kicks with people with that skill level. And it's tough. And then um, one of the things, you know, the elephant in the room for me and what got me out of the MMA business is um, what I now know and what we know as a society about traumatic brain injuries. People often just abbreviate say TBI. Um, is I don't know how many hits it takes to your head before serious brain damage happens, whether it's one, whether it's a thousand, whether it's 10,000. But, you know, there's just mounting medical evidence, overwhelming medical evidence, that it is terrible for you to be t taking heavy blows to the head. And so, like, I have, I have two grandkids. I have three grandkids. Three grandkids, but two of them are boys. And my recommendation to their mother is for them not to play football, for them not to go into boxing, for them not to go to M and A, because it's not good for them to take that kind of punishment to the brain. And you'll see, you know, one of the saddest stories, and it was only well known because Muhammad Ali was so famous, but people mislabeled his disease. They're like, oh, he has Parkinson's disease. But Muhammad Ali did not have Parkinson's disease. He had Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease-like symptoms from repeated blows to the head. You know, from his traumatic brain injury, it caused him to have those type symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but he did not have that disease. And when you look at, and Muhammad Ali was so eloquent, so well-spoken as a young man. And then in his end, end of his life, you know, he, you know, it was, hard to follow him in a conversation. And I heard an interview with Evander Holyfield recently. It was hard to follow what he was saying. But in his younger years, in the 80s, he was very well spoken. And it's just repeated blows to the head. You know, like there's significant damage going on. And not only, you know, for the boxers, but you see that with the football players. And um, it's just not worth the traumatic brain injury. Um, so I would recommend don't go into MMA. And that's why at my school, I only offer Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo. People are like, oh, you should do a striking program, maybe get a cage, run an MMA program. I'm like, no, not interested. Because what I now know about traumatic brain injuries, I could not in good conscience train somebody and in any way encourage them to get in the cage and take them blows to the head. So I don't. Um, does it cost me money? Sure. People that want to fight MMA, they go to the MMA schools in town. And I'm cool with that. You know, like. You make your own choices, but I'm not going to help you towards that traumatic brain injury. I'm, I like to sleep at night, and I'm willing to lose money over that. So that's my answer to this week's question of the week. Um, no one's going to train you for free on a deal that um, you'll pay them back once you make it to the big time. Because in all likelihood, you won't make it to the big time. And I would recommend going to another profession other than MMA. That's me. People can disagree. Maybe you disagree. That's fine. Feel free to make your comments below. And if you got a question for next week, fire below, and I'll be more than happy to answer it. All right. Ciao.